Hi everyone, I'm Dana Thompson, the director of the Brown Planetarium here at Ball State University. And I'm with uh, here with the Constellation crew, a group of Ball State University students going to talk about a constellation in your sky tonight. So uh, part of the Constellation crew, we have Melanie, hi Melanie. And we have Nicolette, hi Nicolette. And we also have Caleb with us, hi Caleb. And we, and we have in the chat, Alec helping out. So if you have any comments or questions or answers to our questions during this presentation, feel free to put them in the chat and uh, we will uh, get to them as soon as possible. Well, today we are starting out as we usually do on campus, looking down at you know the buildings, uh, tennis courts here, and some driveways on campus and we're facing south like we usually do because a lot of the things that we explore in the planetarium and a part of these constellation programs that we put on are in the southern sky but this week the constellation we're focusing on draco the dragon is in the northern sky so we actually have to spin our view around and check out north so let's do that and um, as we do you can see some of campus you can see that the sun is visible in the sky too, here in a second. And you'll notice that the sun is about to set over in the western sky as it should. It rises early in the east and sets in the west, but it's not setting exactly west. So it's a little bit more accurate if we say it sets in the western sky and it rises in the eastern sky. But now it's setting a little south of west as we get into the winter months here. And we have our beautiful town of Muncie, Indiana, where Ball State is a part of, that we're looking down on. And we're actually seeing up the part of campus now that the planetarium is in. So um, right here is where the planetarium should be, but we don't have it in this picture because this was a picture taken before the Brown Planetarium was put in are constructed. Uh, the Brown Planetarium opened, uh, does anyone here know when our Bl Brown Planetarium opened? And I'm gonna be talking to the Constellation crew, but if you're watching along and you know the answer, put any answer uh, to any question that we ask here today in the chat. But I'm gonna pose all my questions today to the Constellation crew and vice versa, I think. So Constellation crew, do you know when the Pl Brown Planetarium opened? You know, it was really recent. I'm just guessing like, 2014 maybe? Can you say that a little louder, Mel? Yeah, I'm guessing 2014, but that's just a guess. I know it was recent. Okay, Nicolette, do you have a guess? Uh, 2012. Okay, and Caleb? Uh, I know it's recent, so I'm guessing 2015. 2015, okay, so we have 2014, 2012, and 2015. One of those is correct. That Ooh. is 2014. So okay. Melanie, you got it. Ah. Yeah. Uh, so in 2014, we opened in uh, October to some groups and officially to the public in November. So uh, it's been, what, like six years since we opened. So that's pretty cool. All right. Um, so now we're looking a little bit around, a little bit closer to sunset here, but we still have some light in the sky. But in order to see uh, the constellation that we're focusing on in the northern sky, Draco the Dragon, which you can see in our backgrounds here, um, we have to make it nighttime, of course, right? We have to speed up time even more, have the sun appear to set in the western sky, and we're going to see the stars appear to move because Earth is spinning out in space. And as I speed up time again, I'm going to ask you to look in the north and see if you notice anything that doesn't really appear to move. All right, so that's your first task for today. So we're going to speed up time. We're gonna look up higher in the sky because now we're just really focused on the stars here. And you can notice that the stars are appearing to move in the sky again because Earth is spinning, but there's two points on our Earth that don't really spin like the rest, the North Pole and the South Pole. That's where the axis of rotation goes through. And so the North Pole is pointing toward an area of the sky all the time, at least every day that we're gonna be on Earth and for hundreds of years to come, um, that doesn't really appear to move like the rest of the stars do. 
So I know that went by kind of fast, but did you notice anything that didn't really appear to move? Most stars will rise over in the eastern sky, kind of over in this region, and they'll go over your heads, and they'll appear to way over your head here, um, set in the western sky like the sun does and the moon does and the planets do in the sky too. But there are some stars that don't rise or set, and there's one star in particular that doesn't really appear to move at all. It's in the northern sky, like I said, and it's actually right above the north here, right here. And that makes sense. Uh, it's in the north because that's where the northern pole on our planet points out in space. All right, so this star is in the north all the time. It doesn't appear to move like the rest of the stars do. It's pretty special, so we should probably give it a name. And what do we call it? Polaris. We call it Polaris. Polaris. And also we refer to it as what? The North Star. The North Star. The North Star, yeah. So a lot of people know about the North Star, right? Um, so we have the North Star Polaris. <laughs> uh, okay, so friends, what's another word in Polaris? So if you could find, yeah, you can find another word in Polaris, pole, right, Melanie? Yeah, um, and that makes sense, right? So pole, Polaris, because the North Pole of Earth points to it. So uh, Polaris, our North Star, is always in the northern sky, at least for us on Earth right now. But we'll find out that in thousands of years, that might not be the case. All right, um, so before we get there, does anyone know what group of stars Polaris is a part of? And if you know the answer, you can put it in the chat. Thank you, Dan, for watching. Um, Dan uh, is telling us it's an excellent program and good job. So Polaris, uh, friends here in the Constellation crew, what group of stars is it a part of? Little Dipper? The Little Dipper, yeah. So let's go ahead and see the Little Dipper because it's kind of hard to see on our screens here, at least for us here. And let's zoom in just a little bit more. All right, so we have the Little Dipper in the sky, that group of stars. Hard to see, especially with light pollution here in Muncie. Usually I couldn't see Polaris, the North Star, and then these two stars here of the Little Dipper, but not much else. And then we know that the Little Dipper is always by another dipper in the sky, the Big Dipper. Try to find it on your own first if you're watching, and then we'll draw it out for you. But you can actually use the Big Dipper to help you find Polaris, the North Star. And this is all going to help us find the constellation Draco the Dragon, I promise, okay? Because that's a really cool one in the sky. All right, so the Big Dipper is pretty low in the sky, right above the horizon, and it's actually a little too close to the horizon to maybe see this time of the year in Muncie after sunset because there's usually trees and buildings in the way. But we can see it in our simulation because we got rid of all of that. And we can draw it out for you. Here's the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper helps you find the North Star Polaris. Don't use the handle. Like some people think that you can use the handle to find the Big Dipper. Uh, did you... I'll know that there's like a, a Simpsons episode with Lisa saying to find the big, the North Star, you use the Big Dipper's handle. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa Simpson, she should know better. Yeah. <laughs> she was wrong. You don't use the handle. What do you use? You use the pointer stars right here. These two stars at the end of the bowl of the Big Dipper here. You connect those with an imaginary line and you go up away from the bowl like you're pouring something out of it away from it and it'll lead you to the north star polaris let's draw that out for you it's five times the distance all right so we have polaris a b here what does that mean why is there this a b here Usually when we see that, um, we are actually looking at more than one star here. Uh, so it's not just Polaris, it's Polaris AB because there are two stars here. And actually one of those stars is another 
binary star system. So there's actually three stars when we look at this region in the sky that are gravitationally bound together. So the AB just kind of tells us that there's more than one star there that we can explore. But to us in our night sky, it just looks like one star. All right. So in between the Big Dipper, these seven bright stars here that are unfortunately too close to the horizon this time of the year to see really well. Um, but in between the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper here, there's a constellation. Uh, and that's Draco the Dragon. But it goes way beyond being just in between here. And we'll see it drawn out in just a second. Um, but just a reminder or to let people know, that the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper here, so the Little Dipper up here and the Big Dipper down here, those are not constellations, but a part of constellations. The Big Bear, Ursa Major, and the Little Bear, Ursa Minor. The Big Dipper and Little Dipper, those are asterisms, like the Summer Triangle and the Great Square of Pegasus that we saw before. All right, so let's see the Draco the Dragon in between the Big and Little Dipper. Oh, and by the way, if you need help seeing um, that Polaris, the North Star is in the north, we put a line up there. But here's Draco the dragon. All right. So I don't know, um, Nicolette, did you have another way of finding it that you wanted to share? Um, other than you can um, follow the same path that you're looking for Polaris and use the exact same path. You're going to follow those two stars at the end of the I call it a ladle as a kid <laughs> um, and you're going to follow as if you're going to Polaris and look for a bright star and then you start to connect the dots again usually um, the beginning of Draco the dragon is the brightest star I can see with all the light pollution going on and that's usually the point constellations are made up of the brightest stars in our night sky that we can see um, but other than that not really yeah. that's the closest I've got but I use that as a kid yeah, I can find Draco in the planetarium with like little to no light pollution. In the real sky, it's a little bit harder. But yeah, that's the squiggling. Yeah, it's just like a little squiggle. And like sometimes I get lost. I'm like, do I go this way? Do I go that way? So it's like up and around the little dipper. So like you kind of go towards the little dipper when you go and loop around. And then you have to loop back around the other way. All right, mm -hmm. so we got a, a big group of stars here. Um, that's probably the dragon's head. And then we kind of go down to its tail down here. So the tail is in between the Big Dipper and Little Dipper and then up to the head there. All right, so let's see if we have really good imaginations what this might look like. There we go. All right, so Draco the Dragon. And some of you might, might be wondering, um, does this have anything to do with some other Dracos we know, right? Because what are some popular Dracos? <laughs> I want to call him my buddy, but he's not my buddy. <laughs> he is popular, technically, with some people. Yeah, I guess so. Some people aren't fans. I'm not. <laughs> Depends on who you ask. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right, so Draco Malfoy, right? Yep. Yes, Draco Malfoy. Draco Malfoy. Draco Malfoy. <laughs> Blonde hair. <laughs> There's so many Harry Potter names and references that are star names or constellations um, like Regulus and Bellatrix and so on. But Draco is like one of the most popular, I think. And Draco the dragon is what inspired his name. Yeah. Draco Malfoy. Yeah. Um, I just learned recently that Draco in all of the Harry Potter movies is only in it for a certain number of minutes. And I thought it was like 36, but we looked it up beforehand. And what did we find out? How many minutes is Draco in all of the Harry Potter movies? 31. 31. Yeah. 31 yes. minutes in all of them. So I don't know. Draco's pretty popular, but apparently not in the movies too much. <laughs> all right. I kind of find it ironic that the constellation it's its name either means serpent or dragon and a serpent or a snake is the mascot for the house that draco is in slytherin <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so a reminder to find it uh you probably won't be able to unfortunately use the big dipper this time of the year um but if you kind of look underneath the north star polaris here in the northern sky you can get to the tail of the dragon 
and it loops all the way up to the head up here. And it's by this bright star right here. Does anyone remember what that bright star is? It's part of the summer triangle. I think, I think this one's Deneb. It's upside yes. down, so I, I, I don't know. Um, it looks upside down to me. I think this one's Deneb and this one's Vega. Pretty oh, sure, okay. I'm pretty sure that's Vega there. I might be wrong. Correct me if oh. I'm wrong. It's like the fifth brightest in the sky, so you could very well be right. And we use that as a reference for magnitude, star magnitude. Yeah. So. Yeah, because uh, I'm used to seeing it in the uh, one facing south, and it's always mm -hmm. Deneb, Vega, and Altair at the bottom. So it's not Altair. It would have to be, I'm pretty sure, Vega. But in any case, it's right by this really bright star in the sky, one of the brightest stars in the night sky tonight after sunset. You might be able to see the head of the Drake, Draco the Dragon that loops back around. All right, there's a really cool star in Draco the Dragon called Thuban. And what's interesting about Thuban? Melanie, help us out here. Um, so it's pretty close to the North Star, you might know. Um, it's just a little bit off from there. And it sort of has acted similarly past. Um, it actually translates in Arabic directly to large snake, so it fits in perfectly. Nice. And Dan Malone in the chat is telling us that it is uh, the star we were talking about earlier, so I got it. Yay. All right, so we were talking about Thuban. Interesting information about it being translated to what snake and serpent? Yeah. Um, why do we have this picture of a of pyramids here. So when the pyramids were being built, Thuban was actually their north star at the time. Yeah, and this is, I think this is a beautiful picture. Um, so we have some pyramids here with the night sky, an amazing night sky. I've never seen a sky like that. And actually, you know, this is a long exposure image, so it's actually picking up some color and stuff. It's way more than what our eyes could see in real life because um, our eyes are limited to the number or the amount of light that they can really receive. But with a camera, you can turn it on and gather lots and lots of light. And with that additional light, you can see more detail and more color. So, so yeah, this one was, was amazing. I had to include it here. And then we also have another um, pyramid photo here with the, with the Milky Way. Because yeah, they think that these were built aligned with the stars. Um, for instance, and not just the pyramids themselves, but the air shafts for like the king's cha chamber was aligned with the constellation Orion, the bright star Sirius, and then um, the, the polar stars. So not just uh, maybe Thuban, which was their north pole star at the time, um, but some other stars nearby because they were, you know, um, you know, building these for thousands of years. So about, what, 4,700 uh, 4, years ago, um, that's when they built some aligned with the North Pole Star at the time here at Thuban. So we talked about how Polaris is our North Pole Star right now, and it's going to be for hundreds of years to come. But almost 5,000 years ago, the North Pole on Earth was pointing towards Thuban instead of Polaris here. And we can actually see where it's going to point to in the future. So through measurements and a lot of data collection, we can infer that there's this kind of circle here that the North Pole of our planet points to over thousands of years. So about 5,000 years ago, we were at Thuban, then time progressed, and now the North Pole on Earth points towards Polaris. But in the future, in the year 4,000, it's going to point over here, and so on. Each one of these numbers, if it's hard to see those, those are each 2,000 years apart. And it takes 26,000 years to get back to where it started. It's pretty wild. A long time. <laughs> yeah. So like when I was like, you know, in our lifetime, we're going to have Polaris. 
but in thousands of years, it might change. So we can actually, in our, comp in our uh, planetarium software, we can speed up time and see what this will look like. So let's see. We're in the year, we started in the year 2020, which by the way, it's still 2020, <laughs> if anyone's wondering. Um, and we were actually uh, getting the star Polaris a little bit closer to the, what we call North Celestial Pole, this region right here. So that region doesn't really change. The North Celestial Pole, always gonna be there, but the star that it's pointing to in the sky it appears to shift. Are the stars really moving like this out in space? No. What is moving instead? Wait. Melanie, oh, Nicolette, Earth. Caleb? Yeah. What? Earth. Earth. Okay. But not like how it does on a daily basis, right? Because this is thousands of years. This is yeah. motion that's happening over thousands of years. So it's not just, it's not because Earth is spinning that's causing this motion. It's because Earth actually kind of wobbles. It wobbles almost like a top out in space over 26,000 years, really, really slowly. Some people refer to this as precession. So instead of wobble, you might hear the word precession. Mm. So it precesses and we see these this shift. Well, like we don't, but over thousands of years when we take data and we um, create charts and graphs and everything and maps, we can see it shifting. All right, when does it get back to Thuvan? It was like 20,000 something. You can find a way to stay alive that long. Yeah, it looks <laughs> like it. <laughs> it looks like it's in between uh, 22,000 and 24,000. We can do a future Rama and accidentally fall into a body <laughs> chamber and then we'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. I don't think those exist yet, though, either. <laughs> All right, there it is. About 20, year 23,000, and we'll get back to Thuban. And then when will we get back to Polaris? So this happens every 26,000 years. It's year 2020. So when will it end about? Around 28,000? Yeah, around 28,000, yeah. I think this simulation actually stops uh, a little short of that for whatever reason, but um, a little short of what it actually would be uh, 26,000 years out. But uh, it's around 28,000, yeah. I think yeah, it stops at 28,008. I can't imagine not having a North Star because some people won't have one or a specific one as close. I know. It's so like, it's like all, it's in our culture everywhere, really. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I can't mm -hmm. imagine, 28,003. Um, but yeah, in 28,000, 28, we'll have Polaris back. Hopefully there are, there are people um, who are able to enjoy it then. All right, well, this is not Polaris. <laughs> this is a completely <laughs> different object in the constellation of Draco the dragon, one of my favorite things in our night sky. What is this, Caleb? Uh, this is a special object known as the Cat's Eye Nebula, which is classified as a deep space object that's known as a uh, planetary nebula. So these are like the uh, the remnants of a, of a low mass stars after uh, they've ejected most of their gases at the end of their life cycles. This is, you know, much of is eventually what our own sun will happen to our own sun in the next five billion years. Yeah. So, and, and sometimes when we see these, they're more spherical. This one has like these long lo like, uh, lobes that are coming out of it. So I think they think that that central star there is actually two stars and the gravitational effects of all that, you know, mass going around each other in the middle there causes these huge lobes on either side. The, and the cat's eye is really far away. It's like 3,300 light years. Just a reminder, a light year is about 6 trillion miles. So it's one of the farther images that we've really um, explored in detail here. 
that were the case, do you think it would become more round over time as those stars got closer together? Or? You know, I'm not sure. I think that it would just exaggerate it maybe more um, because I don't think that it's going to correct what's already happened. Right. So maybe, or maybe the lobes will expand and yeah, well, we won't be able to see them in more detail, but not necessarily because they're going to uh, evolve to become a more spherical shape. But I don't know. And, and they don't even know for sure if it's it's because of those two stars. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, there might be magnetic field lines that are causing that. Um, and magnetic fields are, as we were talking about before we signed on um, the call here, uh, are sometimes pretty complicated to explore. Dana or Caleb, either one of you, do you know if that's one that the picture was actual colors? Because I know that we've talked in the past that some pictures look beautiful, but those are filtered pictures or artist depictions. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Caleb, did you happen to find that out when you were researching the cat's eye? Uh, yeah, I think this particular picture actually is um, not necessarily uh, um, a tick of my picture. Uh, the, I think this is it takes, I think this is spectroscopic from my from my research. So okay, interesting. Um, well, I mean, it won't be that. I don't think um, there are some pictures of the cat's eye in X-ray. I I want to say that this is this is similar to what you would see with your eyes if you were up close because this is not x-ray I think this is visible light but you know that's a good question for Alex so Alex watching with us in the chat and helping out in the chat so if Alex happens to know what this picture or how this picture was taken um, maybe he can put it there but we'll definitely be looking it up afterwards uh, because that's a good question thank you yeah and, and I've uh, doubted Caleb before, not doubted, but just, you know, was a little like, is that all, is that the whole picture, you know? And Caleb's usually been yep. right. So um, we'll see, we'll see what the answer is. We'll see, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> all right, so um, you can imagine this constellation, Draco, uh, in different ways. This is a really old depiction of the constellation and as well as the uh i don't even know this doesn't even look like a bear right because it's got this huge tail and i don't know it looks like a weasel yeah <laughs> is it like is it yeah. like one of ron weasley's weasels or i don't know i think it's i think in the books string them up it turns into a ferret so oh that works oh okay okay so we got a little ferret guy but this is yeah this is the little dipper and um polaris here um, but then here's Draco's tail in between and then his head up here. So he's been kind of drawn as this dragon for a long time. You know, I think I just thought of another uh, pop the culture where there's a, a, a character named Draco. If anyone's seen the film uh, Dragonheart, the main, the one of the characters in that is named Draco. And it's actually, he's actually a dragon, so. Nice. <laughs> and then Dan Malone in the chat is saying that the first six bright stars starting at the head are all multiple star systems for Draco, I think. Wow. So there are so many binary star systems or multiple star systems out there. Um, kind of like what ones aren't <laughs> multiple star systems, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, I don't know exactly when this was drawn out here. However... Nicolette has some stories behind it Yes, that are pretty interesting, right? Yeah, there are a lot of stories about Draco the dragon. Uh, you got your Egyptian story, which is about a goddess who is the goddess of childbirth and birth and fertility, excuse me. I believe the pronunciation is Teret. But please don't quote me on that. I <laughs> names get complicated sometimes when they're in different languages. However, um, today there's a we're going to be talking about the Greek and Roman myths since they are a little bit more connected to Draco the dragon. Uh, one of the first ones is about Hera, the first the first wife of Zeus, or 
I'm not really sure if she was the first, but she was a wife of Zeus at some point. And she received she had a many, many, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hard to keep um, track of them all. Poor Zeus. Um, <laughs> so, or more poor wives of Zeus. Anyway, the golden apple tree was gifted to Hera for um, their wedding as a wedding gift. And she loved her golden apple tree so much that she wanted it to be guarded and protected by um, the Hesperides, I believe that's how you pronounce their names. Were there like a lot of people trying to get those apples or what? Uh, Yeah, a lot of people wanted the apples. Um, One person in particular wanted the apples and she also created Draco the dragon or in this myth, uh, the creature was called Laden. Yeah, Laden. He was a serpent dragon creature, and he specifically was put around the tree so that the other group that was protecting the garden wouldn't pick the apples. <laughs> so Hera didn't trust anyone for her apples. So at some point, I believe it was Hercules who was asked to steal the apples, and he did, and he killed poor innocent Draco the dragon, or Laden the dragon, serpent with poison arrows and he did steal the apples and Hera was so upset that she lost her apples and her friends and she created him that she put him among the stars to honor him and his death the other one is a little bit shorter if you guys remember in your mythology classes you probably heard of Cronus and Rhea Cronus is the god who ate all of his children because he was very upset that at some point one of his kids was going to overthrow him and Rhea didn't want one of her sons to get eaten, so she hid him away and fed Cronus a stone, pretending that that was her baby, Zeus. Um, one of the myths says that Zeus escaped by turning himself into a serpent dragon creature and turning his caregivers or nurses in some other stories into bears, which is kind of ironic since the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper are part of constellations that are bears. So I thought we could talk about that too. But those are the main myths of Draco the dragon. Ironically, he is not called Draco in any of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that is Draco's story. Well, he's called Draco here, even in this older depiction. Yeah, I've tried everywhere to figure out why he's called Draco, other than Draco in Latin means serpent or dragon-like creature. But that's about it. Everywhere else, he has a different name or a different creature name, Hmm. which is very strange, but. Well, Alec put in the chat um, some information about the Cat's Eye Nebula. He said that it was processed, so um, some of the circles are more visible and that there's this diagram that shows detail about it. But when I clicked on that link, even though it's from like an educational website, it's asking me um, if I'm really sure I wanna continue. Um, So I'm not gonna risk it right now being um, streaming live on on Facebook here. But I also did a little bit of searching too, and it looks like um, it is optical, which means it's it's stuff that we can see with our eyes, but they continue to say that um, it was constructed from two narrow band filters showing oxygen and nitrogen atoms, which okay. is difficult to really see um, with just your eyes. So no, it wouldn't probably look like that up close. However, it was still receiving light that our eyes would naturally take in, but okay. processed in a way that you know looks really pretty. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and like the x-ray run, X- Ray uh, photograph of the cat's eye has like reds and greens. It looks almost nothing like the blue one we showed. So you'll see it in different ways depending on how it was taken, what the telescope was really um, taking in, um, but more so what the filter was allowing um, to pass through uh, to a camera that eventually took that picture. So interesting stuff. Yeah. All right, so let's do a quick reminder of how to find it in the sky as we wrap up. And uh, let's bring down our picture here so that we can see a little bit better. There we go. All right, who wants to do a reminder of how to um, 
located. Mel, Mel's been a little quiet this this go. So Mel, do you want to just uh, give an overview of how to find Draco the dragon? Sure, I can. I really like Nicolette's way, but I'll go over both of them. Uh, so you have two options. So uh, we can look for the North Star, which of course is directly north. Um, once you find that, you can usually find at least usually two more stars of the Little Dipper. And if you can find the Little Dipper, then you can find the Big Dipper. Unfortunately, right now, it might be a little bit too close to the horizon. Um, but just generally in between that area and the horizon, you can find that tail star, like Nicolette had said, and kind of work your way up from there. Yeah. Yeah, and you, uh, when you work your way up, uh, loop around the Little Dipper away from the handle of the Big Dipper if you do see that in the sky. Some other um, ways to help you find this constellation is by using an app for your phone or a star map. Um, we usually link to that in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if, if Alec has a link handy or not, but there's lots of different websites and um, Google Sky and everything that will help you find constellations like Draco the Dragon here. All right, any final thoughts? Not for me. Did anyone happen to uh, look up or learn about the history of procession? Uh, oh, yes, I did actually. Um, oh. I, I found some, I, this is some from my own classes, some from like, I uh, was reading about it. Um, the actual discoverer of procession was a guy, was a Greek astronomer known as Arcus, who also was credited for, um, I believe, uh, you know, making what's known as the magnitude scale, what was what we classify as star brightness. Anyways, the story the story goes that uh, Parkus was looking at a uh, ancient Egyptian map, a uh, star star maps, and he noticed that uh, um, star uh, what the Egyptians no, no, uh, identify as North Star, Nubin, was off was 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 off from what at the current time uh, was, uh, was was the North Point. So he noticed that. Uh, the North, Pole, the North Pole had changed in uh, in, the, in the next the last two thousand years. So that's how he was able to figure out that the the Earth was uh, tilting. The Earth actually was tilting uh, over thousands of years. Cool, really cool. Good observation. I don't know. I would have caught that. <laughs> <laughs> would have went way past me. They had a little bit more time on their hands, I think, too. Right. That's true. They, yeah. they, yeah, there wasn't as much to learn. And then also they weren't like addicted to their cell phones. Mm -hmm. Not that, you know, cell phones aren't great. College was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Their version of a cell phone was like the, was a scroll probably. So, yeah, the latest books from Homer. <laughs> so. Would you all like to have lived back then? Or are you pretty good now? Just fine right now. Yeah. I like electricity and modern plumbing, so <laughs> I like it now. Now is good. I kind of feel like I should have grown up in the 80s, though. Okay. Yeah. Great music, great clothes. Great music, great clothes. Great yes. movies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful movies. So I would I would go to this '80s themed dance night every week in Chicago. Um, a colleague in the plantarium field uh, is he grew up in Chicago, and I was like, "Did you ever go to uh, that club for '80s night?" And he's like, "I went to that club in the '80s." <laughs> so anyway, it was the '80s club. All right. Well, we ended up in year two, uh, twenty-eight thousand and three. But this is actually the same sky you'll see tonight here in Muncie after sunset in the year 2020. You'll see Polaris, our North Star in the north, the end of the little, um, the end of the handle of the Little Dipper here. And uh, right next to it is the Big Dipper in the sky, probably too close to the horizon to really spot right after sunset this time of the year. In the middle of it is the end of the tail of the constellation Draco the Dragon, which loops around to ahead right here well thanks so much for tuning in everyone next week we're going to explore the constellation cassiopeia which is melanie's favorite and it's also our planetarium show specialist rachel williamson her favorite as well so she's going to be joining the crew 
and uh, chatting with you all. So we'll see you all next week at 6.30 on a Friday. Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening and a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.